Welcome to Sports Beat KC, the Kansas City Stars daily sports podcast. It is Monday, March 22nd, and I'm Blair Kirkhoff. The Missouri Tigers basketball season came to an end in the first round of the NCAA tournament with a loss to Oklahoma on Saturday night in Indianapolis. The game was close throughout, as you'd expect a game matching the number eight and nine seeds, but Mizzou didn't make enough plays down the stretch to win. So the Mizzou season ends with a 16 and 10 record. And although most college basketball seasons end with a loss, this one might be more bitter because of the way the season started. Missouri jumped off to a terrific start back in November and December. It won its first six games, five against teams that would make the NCAA tournament. And after beating Alabama on February 6th, Missouri was 13-3 and and would be ranked in the top 10 of the AP poll that week. So let's do the math. Uh, that means Missouri finished the season with a 3-7 and record. On today's show, star columnist Vahe Gregorian and I discuss Missouri basketball, what went right and wrong for the team, and we talk about Coach Conzo Martin. Vahe and I also discuss our experiences in Indianapolis at the NCAA tournament. You know, it was an unusual weekend to say the least, with all 68 teams housed in one area. And the tournament isn't leaving Indy. The regional rounds and the Final Four will be played there as well. So, Let's get started talking about Missouri hoops with Vahe Gregor. When there's there's an 8-9 game in the NCAA tournament, you're not really surprised who wins and who loses. You know, that's how the committee, you know, the the teams looked, you know, even in the eyes of the committee. They they selected them, you know, 8 seed, 9 seed. And so you're just not surprised by the outcome of either one. But that doesn't change a level of disappointment uh, for the loser and – one of the teams, Missouri or Oklahoma, was going to be really disappointed on Saturday night in Indy just because of the way the seasons of those teams had, had been going in the last, what, month or so. Missouri had lost, you know, three out of the, they were three and six in their last nine. Oklahoma had lost five out of six. Well, you know, Oklahoma is the one that survives and advances to play um, uh, Gonzaga. Missouri goes home. And I don't know if Missouri played its best game, but Vahe, I don't know if we've seen Missouri play a good game in out of the last out of three weeks to a month. No, I think that's right, Blair. I mean, the the only moment that stands out to me in the last month in a positive way for Missouri was was you know that that pretty nifty win at Florida. You know, the last the last second win there, and um, you sort of thought that might be a reset, and then it wasn't. Um, so really, they kind of sagged for most of the last month of the season. It is interesting thinking about the seeding. You know, they, if I recall correctly on the so-called S-curve or the seeding line, they were exactly the next seed after Oklahoma. I think Oklahoma was the last eight seed. Missouri is the first nine seed. So they were, you know, almost interchangeable. Um, and I don't know if this bears out in the scores of those eight, nine games all the time. So we do know the results are – often, you know, the nine wins and, and a, a coin toss. Um, but this, you kind of felt like it was it slipped away from Missouri in the last, you know, eight or 10 minutes. They had a little bit of a, Missouri had a little bit of a um, burst there in the last minute that made it possible. But I don't know that I really felt faith like they were going to get the right shot off to when they were down 70, 67 and getting the ball back. You just had sort of this little, little flicker of hope that, that it would be the, the moment for them. And, and, and in a way that, that last sequence kind of embodied their season, right? They, they, they just, they had a chance and just couldn't even muster a, a real attempt. Right. Right. I mean, they, they, they got the opportunity because Drew Smith made a good defensive play to uh, block in a shot of Austin Reeves. So Missouri takes over with 17 seconds to go. They don't have a timeout. So they've got a, create on the fly and what was created uh, just, you know, you end up with um, who who was it? Drew Bugs driving the lane and getting fouled, you know, putting himself in a position where he has to make the first miss the second on purpose. And that did happen. Free throws that did happen, but only 2.5 seconds remained. And there just wasn't enough time to do anything with that. Um, So uh, a really disappointing loss for Mizzou. Let me just say this. I, you know, we were, we'll look at those last – Drew Smith, a couple of three-pointers to get Missouri from eight to three in that last minute. That was terrific. 
Uh, but I thought Missouri lost the game with about six minutes to go. Drew Smith hit a three-pointer to give Missouri a 55-54 lead. Oklahoma, Oklahoma comes down and gets two free throws to go back up by one. And then on the next three possessions, with it being a one-point game, Missouri misses three three-pointers. Two of them were air balls. All of them were ill-advised. I think Drew Smith missed one, Mark Smith another, and, and Kobe Brown maybe the third. And that's where Missouri needed to play smart, patient, work the offense, get a good shot, and they didn't do that. And Brady Maddock turns around and hits a big three to make it a four-point game, and then Oklahoma begins to extend it. So I think that stretch from about six minutes to three minutes is where Missouri had an opportunity to, to, to assert control. It couldn't do it, didn't do it, and, and that's why Missouri's heading home and, and Oklahoma's going to play Gonzaga. In, in the second round. So um, maybe after- Mitchell, Mitchell Smith might have, might have thrown one of those up Blair. And I okay. remember, I'm, I'm not sure about that, but I think twice in the game he did. And I could, I think I flinched and I could feel a little body language from you each time. It, it, it just didn't seem like it just was not the right thing to settle for. And that again, is a little microcosm of their last month, right? Shot selection became a big deal. Yeah, it did. Yeah, and I, what I noticed with Missouri is kind of an in, inability to break down defense with individual play. It's just difficult for the, you know for them to get shots by you know by by with with individuals. The other thing was Xavier Pinson not playing well down the stretch of of the season and certainly of this game. He ended up spending the you know the, most of the second half on the bench. I don't think Conzo Martin trusted him in the, in the game. So that's a guy that they really depended on early in the season and had some great moments for Missouri early in the year. But Xavier Pinson was just not a, was not the same guy at the end of the year as he was early on. And that's, that was too bad for Missouri. Yeah, All right. And I'm not sure this is correct, but I think that when Conzo pulled him early in the second half, that was it. I, I'm not sure he came back in the game. I, I he, he did. I know he came back in and he and he had a turnover. He was trying to yeah. get an entry pass, or he he had a turnover, and then maybe a, a shot blocked when he was going to the basket. Just almost like he he was didn't know what he was doing out there. And you, know, you hate to see that. Maybe look, maybe there was an injury. I, I think there had, he had been dealing with a foot, but maybe the severity of it was it was was greater than what we were led to believe. I, I don't know, but I, I felt bad for him. Honestly, I think there's a I think there's a little bit of a trust question from Conzo to him. I think that that that's kind of come into play. And look, it leads to speculation what you know some of the future elements of of this team are going to be. You know, some things like that. Nice segue, Vahe. So let's look at the uh, <laughs> let's look there. I, I you know the the seniors have eligibility because of COVID nineteen. All seniors in college sports do this year. I get the sense that we're not going to see Jeremiah Tillman, Drew Smith, Mark Smith. I don't know about Mitchell Smith um, in in a Missouri uniform next year. So that leaves players like Xavier Pinson and uh, Kobe Brown, Parker Brown, who with with uh, who are underclassmen and can come back. Missouri's got a you know they've they've got a handful in the recruiting class. None of whom are like top fifty type players. Um, I, I don't know if it's a rebuild. It's certainly a reshaping of Missouri next year looms for this program. I think that's right. And, you know, it is interesting when you add that element about seniors. I mean, it, it, it's hard to know which ones would feel it behooves them to come back. Maybe there's a nice surprise in there somewhere, but I, I think probably unlikely and I think, by and large, we're looking at somewhat of a fresh canvas and how that turns out as whether it's a rebuild or, or a, you know, just a reset is really going to be an interesting question. Because for all the things you could say about the state of the program and not having won a tournament game now since 2010 and being 0-2 under Conzo, you can also look at, you know, it's kind of a cliche, but the foundation is, is somewhat different these last four years than it had been in the four or five years before that with Frank Hayes' departure and leaving a really, really complicated and, and, and rather difficult uh, scholarship situation for Kim Anderson and Kim never been able to get over, over that hump. You know, the numbers are night and day in terms of regular season play and wins and 
And I think just sort of currency of the program. On the other hand, they sit here kind of stuck at this at this stage. And to think Missouri won, you know, there's one thing to have the Norm Stewart era, but even I was looking at these numbers yesterday, Blair, and I think it was nine, nine NCAA tournament wins between the turn of the century and 2010 and zero since then. And that's, you know, we, we all think, I, I, I shouldn't say we all, but I know the two of us think extremely highly of Conzo. He's everything I'd want to be in the face of a program. And um, I just wish it would be, he'd make it easier on Missouri fans by winning a, a tournament game or two here. That's a good way of putting it, Vahe. And yeah, that's, that, that's a great note about the, the tournament wins. I remember Missouri getting to the elite eight in 2002, the, you know, the Kareem rush team. And, and then again in uh, 2009 with Demari Carroll and uh, you know, those were teams that, that, that built a pretty good NCAA tournament reputation, you know, for the program in, in that decade. But you're right. It's now a six game losing streak in, in the NCAA for Mizzou. And yes, I think that's a good way of putting it too, about, you know, Conzo Martin could make it easier on himself, uh, could have made it easier on himself with a victory in this game. Nobody would have expected a, uh, a triumph over Gonzaga. And we certainly don't with Oklahoma now uh, meeting up with uh, the nation's top ranked team in the, in the second round, but gosh, just, just one, I, I got to tell you, I, I got back to my hotel room last night and I rode up the elevator with a pair of Missouri fans. I, I didn't know them. I just, they were wearing their, their Missouri gear. And, and I just said, you know, darn Missouri. And they just shook their head and said, I, yes, every, all, all the time, every year. Um, now look, they've got to the NCAA tournament. That was that was a little bit unexpected based on our preseason projections of this program, but, um, but they rose those expectations with their play, beating Illinois and beating uh, Oregon and, and having victories over Alabama and Tennessee during SEC play. And, and then the, 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 the poor play at the end of the year and, and, um, and, and then not to win an NCAA tournament game. I, I guess I understand fans who want to question whether Conzo Martin is going to get it done ultimately at Missouri. But I, I think, I think I'm with you on this. I, I think we're of the same mind that, you know, we want to see him get it done. And, and I think he's, he's a good enough coach to get the opportunity, get more opportunity to, to, to succeed at, at Missouri. He's got a seven year contract. He just, he just finished the fourth year of seven. So, and I don't, I don't get the sense Jim Sturk is in any, any rush to make a move at, at, uh, at that position. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think so. I mean, I, I suppose we could get blindsided, but I know there's some contractual things that make it pretty compulsory anyway. Um, I just think that, you know, sometimes turning these corners is, is, is different than what we might understand or, or even be able to really, really know. Um, it's just, um, it's just, I don't know what to say, but it's just too bad because you, you, I like what you just stressed. It, it is that we want to see him get it done because I think we understand that he's such a, a, a kind of a face of integrity and conscience in, in, at a time where that's, that's a big part of the job too. Yep. You know, what you stand for and who you are and, what the program can, what people that follow the program can buy into. And um, I don't know, Blair, I think the last year has, has, has shaped me a little more toward thinking that way than I think about the cold results. And look, he, again, he was, he was one of 68 teams um, standing at the, at the end of the season. I'll also add that, um, you know, the development of Jeremiah Tillman was, it was impressive. Uh, made his way to uh, all-conference level uh, by the time he was a senior. Drew, Drew Smith, who transferred, started his career in the Missouri Valley at Evansville, ends up a first-team all-conference player by the end of his career. Player development's part of the deal, too, and I think, um, I, I think this coaching staff deserves credit for, for, for that as well. So I, I think the, the, the final underscoring of the disappointment, though, is I, I hearken back to something. I think we were both watching either a game at the same time together or just talking about Missouri early in the season. And I think, again, I hate to put words in your mouth. My feeling was 
okay, we're seeing what a, this is a Conzo team. This is what, what his team should be and will be. And, you know, there's a postscript to that now, which is that this is how it played out. And I, I, I don't know, maybe that's not a, a, a great assessment, but it, it, it's part of what the disappointment is that you sort of have the sense that they're finally realizing what the potential will, will be with, with him. And then no. Let's take a break. Um, and we'll be back in just a moment. Hey, it's Blair. We have a special subscription offer for sports beat KC listeners, unlimited digital access to the Kansas city stars award-winning sports coverage. Sign up now for one year of Sports Pass for access to all the sports news, features, and columns presented on the KansasCity.com site, and it's only $30. That's a 40% savings off our regular rate. Your subscription will automatically renew after the initial term at $50 unless you tell us to cancel. Your subscription helps support the sports coverage of KansasCity.com and the Kansas City Star, and that support has never been more important please visit kansascity.com slash sportsbeatkc offer to get this special offer. And as always, thanks for listening. Okay, back with Vahe Gregorian. And Vahe, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to ask you about the experience in Indianapolis that, uh, uh, you know, I, I was there over the weekend, you were there over the weekend, and it was the most unusual NCAA basketball tournament in history, uh, there are um, 68 teams all came to Indiana. Some games are played at, at Purdue and some at uh, uh, IU in Bloomington. But for the most part, everybody was, was in Indianapolis and um, uh, limited uh, seating in, in the arenas. I think the, the, none of the arenas could have more than 25% capacity. So, uh, so downtown Indianapolis was able to handle – 68 teams they put them all in the in the downtown high-rise luxury hotels like the jw marriott and the and the weston um you know i i, I walked around a lot in downtown indy over the weekend and you know the the, the bars and the restaurants weren't full but um but but anyway I, I i i commend indianapolis for for pulling it off they did have the embarrassing moment with the with the weight room issue with the, the, the men's tournament versus the women's tournament and we, that's absolutely worth, you know, exploring at, at some point. It's certainly at a, at a deeper level. But I, I want to keep this just on your experiences in Indianapolis. And, you know, you went and saw KU play on Saturday in the afternoon and then in one venue and then came, and then came over and saw Missouri at night, joined me with, with Missouri. What, what, uh, what struck you about, about Indianapolis and holding a, an entire tournament in, in inside its, uh, you know, inside its city limits. Well, you know, it's funny, a, a lot of things, but, you know, we've been here for most, so many events over the years, right? And, and you, you, Final Fours in particular, where it's overrun and gridlocked and, you know, you, you, you can't get in any place because it's too full. It's like, and this is like the flip side of the Yogi Berra line about nobody goes there anymore. It's too crowded. Um because you you know you don't quite want to go in some of these places, uh, and not many are open. Um, you know, yesterday morning and this morning, I went out um, on walkabout a little bit, and uh, it, it, if you wanted to sit down, if you wanted to get just hot food, it, it turned out I needed to wait in line at a Starbucks. Um, there were a couple other options, but you know some restaurants that are open are not practicing the distancing with tables, so you didn't. I didn't really want to go in there. Um, and there are very few of those, you know, all the times we've been here, Blair, this is sort of a side point, but this morning I went over by the, the, the war memorial right in the middle of that, that circle. And I realized I'd never just sat there and looked at it as many times as I've been here. And, um, it was just a nice calm setting. And that's, what's kind of funny. There's some nice calm settings here in Indianapolis during this with dozens of teams here, the loudest noise I remember hearing, there was some, you know, some nightlife, but it was, a uh, the sort of repeated um, rhythm of, of police escorts taking teams to venues. So, um, you know, the venue itself, it, it was interesting for me to have the contrast with uh, KU playing at the uh, Indiana Farmers Coliseum built in 1939 versus Lucas Oil with you last night. I really appreciated seeing the game in kind of one of the old barn type settings. It, it did get a, 
a makeover in 2012, but it was a, it was a building made the year the NCAA tournament started. And I, that, that gave me a little sense of that spirit. Um, it was interesting though, also that the attendance, I think they were allowed to have up to 1200, but it was like 961. So that tells you that, you know, as much as we think we're, this is a good, let's get back with it kind of thing. People remain wary as they should. And I think travelers are well advised to, um, you know, consider whether that's worthwhile in some form or another. I do feel like, though, having the tournament again has been a real boost. We've just been here in the cocoon. It's a little hard to know what it means to people in, you know, all over the country in some ways. I don't know what the ratings are yet, but it just seems like, okay, sort of warped as it is from usual circumstances, it has it not been a pretty captivating thing. It sure seems like it. Well, we, we know the Kansas attendance was 961 because Bill Self looked at it and read it off of, a, off of a stat sheet as he was commenting on the temperature in the building. The, I think he said it was, he thought it was 58 degrees at the beginning of, the, yeah. of his game. I, was, I thought that was, that's pretty funny. Usually a lot of bodies in a building will take care of that, but that's not exactly. the, it's the coldest, coldest he'd ever been at the start of a game. And it's kind of funny. That was actually to my question, which normally, you know, asking the atmosphere question doesn't get you far. Um, <laughs> or, you know, you get something pretty perfunctory, but I felt like I had to lob it out there. And Bill, as he often does, uh, went with the pitch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny especially handy on deadline <laughs> yes yes <laughs> um yeah well a couple things that i noticed first of all when i was there on friday morning so the morning that the tournament started i couldn't believe the, the number of and I, I guess it's for obvious reasons the number of different sweatshirts and and jackets of different teams that i was seeing it was amazing there was colgate walking with texas Hartford and Rutgers walking with Oral Roberts and UCLA. It was just, you know, it was like there had been a, a, a you know, a, a sale at the rally house or something and everybody got the, 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 the sweatshirts, but that, so then those are, you know, those are the parents and the high donors, right. Uh, of, yeah, those are the only yeah. people that, that were able to get, get into the building. And, you know, you mentioned the, the buses and the sirens. That's the other thing. It's, you know, if you were, if you heard a siren in downtown Indianapolis, you, 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 you which you likely did almost every hour, those are three buses pulling out of the Marriott, the JW, the Weston, the, the Sheridan, because that was a team leaving to go to one of its one of its games. It, it wasn't like crime, you know. It was, it was a big crime uh, it, it yeah. three in Indianapolis <laughs> weekend. It was police escorting all these teams to the different to the different venues. So, no, quite something. You know, something I, I don't imagine we'll ever see again. And uh, but it was interesting to experience it. Uh, th- this weekend. And I suspect, I suspect it'll change next weekend when we're down to just uh, 16 teams. And certainly for the, for the final four, I, I don't think you're going to get many more fans there. In fact, have you, have you have fewer fans because the, 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 the reduction of the number of teams and they're not going to allow more fans into the building. So that'll, um, th- that'll also be uh, interesting for, for Indianapolis as the, as the month unfolds. Well, well, it is interesting, right? It naturally does make you think about, Okay, would this ever be a desirable thing to do when you can have full capacity? And it seems to me maybe it might be desirable, but it's not at all doable if you have capacity because you, no few cities anywhere could accommodate that that amount of people in, in the hotels. I mean, I, I just don't see how it could be done. It it'd be fun to sort of overlay the thinking it into whether it could ever play out in Kansas City, but. You know, you'd have to have Lawrence and Columbia involved, and and uh, it, it it just it I just don't think it could hold up in an ordinary year with full attendance anyway. I agree. I agree. Hey, so Vahe, before before we go, uh, I know you're working on a column that by the time this podcast drops, will have been posted on KansasCity.com, and uh, you had a conversation with one of the heroes of the first week or, or the, the mother of one of the heroes, the first weekend of the NCAA tournament. His name is Joe Pleasant. I love the name played at blue Valley Northwest and dropped in the two free throws with what about a second to go in Saturdays. It was the final game of the Saturday schedule and 14th seeded Abilene Christian 
defeated uh, third seeded Texas, the Big 12 tournament champions. And, you know, what, of course, what makes this especially interesting to us is that, uh, you know, is that Joe uh, attended uh, Blue Valley Northwest. He won a couple of high school, you know, Kansas 6A championships at, at Blue Valley Northwest under coach Ed Fritz. Uh, and he's one of two Kansas City area players, actually three, that are on the Abilene Christian roster. So what did you find out talking to uh, Joe Pleasant's uh, mom? Well, first of all, the, the, the last name is apt. Uh, they, they were there. <laughs> she was very pleasant, uh, very, very, very funny, too. I mean, she was saying that, that he got no athletic genes from her, that she was on the bench with Forrest Gump was how she put it. And <laughs> but I hadn't realized this that uh, until last night. Um, that, that Joe's father was an, an NFL player, two Super Bowls with the yep. Patriots, and um, and and uh, a former Chiefs assistant. Yeah, spent a little time on the Chiefs staff. Yeah, and so it just uh, just she had she was pretty interesting talking about kind of the nervous energy um, that she had full faith in Joe, but but she's a nervous wreck. And I also spoke with Ed Fritz, the the high school coach, and. He kind of painted a funny scene because he's in Las Vegas visiting family on spring break. And he said he was prancing around in a restaurant while Joe was shooting the free throws. And (laughs) somebody asked him if uh, he must have had a lot of money on the game. And he was proud to be able to tell the guy he didn't have any money on the game, just that one of his guys. (laughs) Um, So and it was interesting, Blair, also to listen back to the news conferences from last night. Uh, Joe Golding, the, the coach of Abilene Christian, was was very eloquent in describing how this is the kind of moment that makes March madness. Um, and uh, Joe, Joe Pleasant was uh, sort of mild mannered as his mom describes him, but, but was pretty funny when he was asked about uh, his dad saying he was a lousy player uh, 10 years ago. Um, Joe, Joe couldn't even get uh, chosen in pickup games. So he's, he's, he's come a long way and, and look, I don't know if this is possible. If, if I, but I, you do wonder if if Abilene Christian is able to, you know, put that behind them in a healthy way. If if UCLA is a a, a, a beatable team for for them as an 11 seed, and um, I, you know, I don't know. It may, maybe the Cinderella time has come, but it, it'd be wouldn't it be something to see them beat the Big 12 champ and then one of the most storied programs in the game. Yeah, look, that was uh, that was an amazing victory for for Abilene Christian. Well, first of all, they would have any victory in the NCAA tournament would have been glorious <laughs> for that program. But to beat Texas, right, the flagship school of the state, and uh, that was amazing. And um, it, many many at Abilene Christian just took great satisfaction with that. Hey, listen, it wasn't even the first game winning free throws by a Kansas City area high school player over the weekend. Player. Christian Bishop, who plays for Creighton, dropped in a couple of free throws at the end as Creighton avoided the upset against uh, the University of California, Santa Barbara. Christian Bishop went to Lee Summit West. So uh, good weekend for Kansas City area high school players in the NCAA tournament. Very cool to see and um, and something we'll continue to keep an eye on with the likes of um, with, with uh, Christian Brown, who was... Uh, also went to Blue Valley Northwest. And, of course, Parker Brown, his brother, played for Missouri, and they were eliminated by, by the Sooners. So, anyway, good weekend for the, uh, for, the, for the local kids in the NCAA tournament. All right, Vahe, uh, thank you so much for the conversation, my friend, and we will talk to you again soon. All right, player, sounds good. That'll do it for today. Thanks to our Sportsbeat KC production staff of Derek Donovan, Beth Welsh, Monty Davis, Jeff Rosen, Chris Fickett, and Savannah Smith. And tip of the cap to Vahe Gregorian for stopping by and talking Mizzou and NCAA tournament with me. Links to our stories can be found in the show notes and on KansasCity.com. Hey, we have another deal for you. For a limited time, you can subscribe to Sports Pass for 99 cents a month. That's right, 99 pennies a month. After three months, it auto renews at $5.99 a month unless you cancel. And what a time to subscribe. The Royals are at spring training for another week or so. March Madness is here, and it is never not chief season. So how do you get this? You go to kansascity.com slash sportspass2020. That's kansascity.com slash sportspass2020. You want more than just sports coverage? Check out the entire Kansas City Star product. Sports news features, commentary, and analysis, the whole thing. 
to get all the stories written by my talented colleagues, plus additional national news, sports, and business coverage with the E-Edition. The details for all of these deals can be found at accounts.kansascity.com slash subscribe. If you're having trouble hunting down any of those offers, send me an email, bkirkoff at kcstar.com, and I will get you to the right place. So whether it's the Sports Pass or the full subscription, you're getting and supporting the best sports and news coverage in Kansas City and helping us produce programs like Sports BKC. Thanks for listening, and we will be back on Tuesday with another episode.